When I was a little girl, there was uh, the bombing of Dresden in the February 1945. We are sitting in the cellar, and we were anxious, and after some hours there came a neighbor and said, your house is bombed, the fire is very, very big, and you have to go out and not to stay there. Now it was so catastrophe for me. I felt this many, many years in my dreams. I lived in our family house in Amblee, which was a big house. It was a lovely house. My dad built it actually. It was a very family orientated because I've got three sisters. So there was always a house full. It was like in a valley, it's tiny. There's probably six houses nearby and a pub and a train station. But the train stops there twice a day because it's so quiet and no one ever gets on. My mother lived in Andrews Road all her life until the day she died. I have one brother. He's still living in the same house that my mum had been in all her life. Her parents must have been in, been in there from about 19... 17, probably about 10 years before her, so overall my family's lived in the same house for over 100 years. It had no electric at the time. And I think my granddad put, had some put in downstairs. And I remember as a kid that they only had plug sockets downstairs and none upstairs. They had an outside toilet, no bathroom. And as the years went on, the landlord put a bathroom in when I was about 19. I was an naughty child. My mum couldn't tolerate me anymore because she's got learning difficulties herself as well. So she gave me into foster care. I was with the same foster care for 10 years. She was lovely. Uh, she treated me as her own. Um, I had everything that I could have asked for. Um, she treated me like she would as her normal children, telling me what I can and can't do within reason. Um, if I'm good and, and everything. it was, But normally you get passed around to, in the social care side, which I was kept in, in the same foster care home for 10 years. Surroundings of the farm were very nice. Mountains around and the village uh, 300 metres away. But there was a, a shed above all. I, I heard it when the adults speak about the old times. Only. 13 years ago when I was born. It was not so long. And they often tell, oh, when Hitler comes here, everybody cries and they, uh, the, the people were excited. When he was leader of, of Germany, he built uh, big houses about 15 kilometers away from our farm. He liked these mountains, I think. Uh, this was the reason he said this is the most beautiful uh, area of Germany and he wants to live here and he has good ideas for politics. So I think, oh, it's like me. I, I, I like the, the mountains too. He has a good taste. Mm. But then I, I felt that Hitler was a bad man too. Everybody, a lot of people said it. And when I was a child, I couldn't understand this. I, I had the feeling that the bad thing and the good thing are always narrow related. My great grandparents moved here during the the wind rush. I'd say that they were, I guess maybe the best way to describe them was like sort of economic immigrants because they the, the plan was to move over here for a while, earn a bit more money because there, because there were not a lot of opportunities back home at the time and then eventually go back. Whilst working she was a nurse at St Elizabeth Hospital. Maybe even a decade before I was born she was living in, um, in Peckham, Montague Square. And it's, um, yeah, it's basically a second home for me. I was that's where I would go to when school was fi when school was finished for the day, rather than going straight home a lot of the time. 
It was in a village a little bit, you know, it was not directly in the middle, a little bit, a little bit outside, a big huge house and places where everybody lived. And I had to sleep with my grandparents. So I had a little uh, bed and I was there in their room. There's always something uncomfortable was this. You know, um, either because of so many people or of not being seen, of not knowing what was going on, hearing a lot but not knowing exactly what it was. So, you know, sometimes I have the feeling I was sitting someplace and maybe under the table, next to the table, and just listening. I'm really uncomfortable. I was born in Barnstable in North Devon. Uh, I grew up living with my maternal grandparents. Uh, they lived with us uh, in the house always. Uh, my mother, of course, was, was born in Barnstable. My mother is actually now living in a house opposite the house that she was born in. My father came here as a refugee from Latvia at the end of the Second World War. So in primary school, people would ask, well, where is your father from? And I would say, well, he's from Latvia. And go, where's that then? Uh, well, it's kind of, it's, it's next to Russia. Oh, well, he's a communist then. And I never really knew what to say to that. I, I, I can just remember feeling, um, always feeling trapped. <laughs> Most people associate that with living maybe in, in, in cities or in, in, in very built up areas. And Barnstable is not a built up area. And of course, it's surrounded by a huge amount of space and countryside. So moving to London was just, uh, uh, I, I did, when I got off the train at Euston Station, I felt very happy. Barnstable was always a lovely, lovely place to live, very slow and relaxed. Still a place where you can walk around and people will know everybody. You go into town and if you want to be quick in town, it never happens because you're forever chatting to people that you grew up with. Um, to people that you know through a family member, through friends. So that, that's a good thing, that's still there. My parents moved to Barnstaple and my grandmother was a great help to them and to me as a baby in fact. I spent a lot of time with my grandparents because my mother had pleurisy, she was very ill and at the same time when I was just an infant my father developed Tuberculosis, I'm sorry about that. Um, very working class family, my family. But my grandmother uh, would step outside her, herself then as a, a, a working class woman with very little education. In fact, she always wanted to be a nurse, but as a child she'd suffered very, very poor sight and had um, operations to save her sight. Um, but when she knew my father had been sent to Hawkmoor, where there was no hope, she went to the doctor, apparently, and kicked up such a shindig that they then moved my father to Hawley on Dartmoor, where he stayed for two years and came out alive with one lung. So in those early days, it was very hard financially for my parents. I am born to uh, Cologne. Uh, and a little uh, small place in the near fun. And my um, grandfather, grandmother, have a farm, a little farm with uh, big um, cats, um, chicken, and uh, a horse. And in this place, I was uh, 25. Five years. My home is the place of my birth, my parents' home, my language and my dialect. My childhood, which was uh, very well integrated in the community of my village. Home means tradition and special rituals. I grew up on a remote farm in in Exmoor 
it's a small holding. Um, my dad was from Sunbury on Thames and my mum's from Southampton. So I think initially when I was young, my dad used to commute backwards and forwards to the Southampton area, um, leaving my mum with all the children and running a and b and a holiday cottage and a, a small holding. So, And she didn't drive, so we were miles from anywhere. The nearest village was two and a half miles away and the nearest bus is six miles away. And so it's a lovely place to grow up. And as a small child, it's fantastic. We had loads of freedom. We were just, we could go out for, you know, miles without ever getting into any trouble, really, because there was nothing about it. It was, it was just countryside and nature. I, can, I remember the great days of having great fun in my, in my parents' house. My parents used to have parties regular. Police would come, neighbours would complain because they were always white around. Oh, I always complain, you know, having them parties and this and that, I can't understand the bloody old music. <laughs> and it was like, what? And the police would come round. Come in. It could be, there'd be Africans in there, there'd be Asians in there, there'd be whites in there, there'd be Caribbeans in there. And we all just had a good time. <laughs> About three o'clock in the morning, curry goat goes around and that, you know what I mean? You used to have like your black pudding and stuff like that. It was a nice, it was nice times. And even now in Koiba Moor in Bavaria, I still uh, I've been only for 25 years by now, but it doesn't really belong to the town. I mean, I always met people who were very nice and we got nearly friends. This is one side, but uh, she is not from Bavaria. I mean, nobody really said it to me, but you know, it's a little bit of feeling that well, she doesn't really belong here. <laughs> well, in this little village where I was, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite funny. I went there a few years ago just to have a look. Somehow, somehow I was feeling, well, this is my home. I mean, after the days of my husband, I thought I could go again back to, well, or go somewhere else, but I, I didn't do it then. <laughs> it's, my son was only 10, and it would have been hard for him to lose his father, and then he, is, I mean, for him, Bavaria is uh, his, his home, and wow. his, and so I didn't think it would be a good uh, idea or good for him to take him away. And then we entered uh, this building and we sit down, sat down in the hay and uh, we found a little place for our family. My grandmother, my aunt, my uh, cousin and uh, my brother, my mother and I. Uh, now we feel safe, but not long. After that, there came the Russian soldiers. They went into the barn and said, woman, come out, come out, come out. And then the woman tried to hide in the hay. And they took some forks and it was so terrible and I had so much anger and fear. And now my mother said to me, cry, cry, loud, very loud. And I began to cry. And I asked why, but she said, cry, cry. And then my brother began to cry. And after that, all children, in this building began to cry. And after that crying, it was so loud, so loud, uh, the soldiers went out. This was quite a wonder. Shadok has um, a very large um, Latin American um, population um, and Overall, uh, you know, a sort of a, a lot of non non British um, uh, culture, and that's 
to to a, to a much stronger extent than um, you would have like uh, you would find in in Munich. You know, there is a lot more sort of cultural diversity that you can that you can find here. This is this is one of the things that I genuinely enjoy about living here. Um, that being said, I'm of course in the fairly privileged position that you know I am white male, um, reasonably uh, well earning. So I am in the demographic that suffers uh, the least from you know all of the all of the the, the issues here. It's not a bad area. We've had our fair share of trouble, abuse and knives and things. But I suppose that's because there's such extreme differences in backgrounds. You know, there's such diversity. And there's a quite big divide as the years go on between the richer and the poorer people. Somebody I I, I worked with uh, for quite a few years at the Southwark City Learning Centre, a black single mother. And I was I, I was having a moan about something and we, I mean, we always got on very well, but she did rather pointedly say to me on this occasion, but Simon, that's not your world and you have no connection to it. And she was right. It's, 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 um, my, my world in Peckham is a very different world than if I was a black teenage boy growing up in Peckham. And that would be, a, that would be a very, um, that would be a very different situation, and I, I and I can't I can't put myself in that situation because I have no experience of it. Um, only only today, I was talking I was talking to my partner, and she had literally just left the library. It must have been less than half an hour before Damalola Taylor was stabbed, and yeah, it's about it's about when when you're in places where. You're so close to where things are not right and where people are not getting on, where there is violence and aggression. And it, it, it wings you, literally. So I decided to start working in the catering trade. I don't forget, I used to work down Liverpool Street, Stripe Street. One day I came in and I was doing cooking and stuff like that. And my manager said, oh, she can't do cooking no more. I said, all right. She said, tell me the truth. She was my friend. And they looked at her and they went to her and said, oh, there's a reason why, because you're black. They don't want no black man touching the food. I was devastated. I was. They were so stupid. They'd done the best thing for me. I didn't leave. I stayed on, three months down the line. Company folded up. I went to work for Royal Mail. They said, oh, yeah, the company trained a chef, and I got there. You know, the usual tricks. They made me a cake assistant, so I was serving food and stuff like that. If I wanted over time, what I'd do, I'd do the tables and stuff like that. And then I was going on little courses here, there, going to Smithfield Market and stuff like that, going for a week and learning about butchering and all that sort of stuff. Then I started working on breakfast. Then from there I did veg, then I did fish. Then from there I went, up, I went on to um, pastry. Then from there I went on to mains, doing like meats and sauces. And that was good, so I learned everything. I got a job as a care worker. And you worked, I used to work Monday to Friday. It used to be a job that I could fit the, take the children to school be there to pick them up. It was mainly shopping and cleaning then. As the years went on, people demand wanted more sort of personal care. And th so the role changed, so we ended up sort of doing more personal care, which we never did before, you know, washing, feeding. Everybody's different, don't they? We, everybody varies. The clients are all different nationalities. We've got work carers from all different sort of nationalities. The job has changed a lot. You've got less time with each person than you used to have. 
Sometimes you've got like 45 minutes and that 45 minutes you're meant to get someone up, give them a wash, give them their breakfast, change them. You can't, and it's quite a rush. You moved around a lot more often to different people and you don't spend as long with one person like you used to anymore. They wish they had more regular carers. They kept on being teased a lot just because I was in a wheelchair and I thought this is not right whatsoever and because I just thought I'm not going anywhere this way <laughs> so um, yeah and I was a bit kind of like scared to like speak up because they were knocking my confidence right down because I was so scared that they were going to because it was just the unknown that I was a bit scared of yeah, because I have to ask for help because none of the teachers were going to help me. So I had to get my parents to help me. So I went to the thing called the tribunal court because they wouldn't, because the, the teachers wouldn't let me, they wouldn't even let me, well, just, they wouldn't even let me go because they were just saying, no, we, we wanted to stay, but then I don't want to, to be honest. And because we were trying all sorts of different schools that were in my level, but they were full up. So that was when we went to tribunal court, and that was when I went to Hampshire Way called Trelaws School. And that was when I found out I could do botcher. So then I went to um, Special Olympics and um, I did other competitions. When you was born disabled, years ago, you only have the possibility to go to an, a school for disabled, for disabled children. Um, and then it opened a little bit, but the steps are very, very small. And now all the people and the politicians talk about in inclusion, but talk and act are not the same. Well, since my Tourette's became more prominent and started to occur a lot more frequently, um, it I guess the way that people react to me has has changed significantly. I'd say that seven times out of ten I do get like very negative sort of responses to it. But none of that deters me from from traveling and and speaking to people because I just have to do it anyway, I have to get on with it. I live in supported living, so I'm doing different activities now. On the Monday I do like life skills, you know, like paying bills, you know, just tidy your bedroom, you know, sort of like life skills, what you do at home really, but just have support. And um, on a Tuesday, I go to here in the plough and do dance and drama. And then my father uh, begged us to come to the western part of Germany. And then uh, it was a very, very big adventure. Because we are not allowed to go to the western part of Germany. And so my mother had to beg to be to beg for a, a paper to go out for a visit to Western Germany to the grandparents, but there were no grandparents. These were the, the colleagues of my father, and they said we are the grandparents now. <laughs> now she got a paper, but there was written for my mother and one child, one child. That means they would have the 
<laughs> the security to to uh, that they, we will come back to the eastern part. Now, my mother had a good idea. She looked for a writing machine with a, so with the same ta type, and she wrote on this paper her name. One child was written there. She made comma, the feminine, one child masculine. And so we went in, in the train and went till Berlin. In Berlin, there was uh, the police and they came and looked. My mother uh, was very, very clever. She said nothing. And after some minutes, the man said, oh, okay, okay. And then we went uh, to the western part of Berlin and after that to, uh, to, uh, to the western part of Germany. We had big problems when we the, the East German cannot visit us, it was forbidden. So we want, uh, tried to visit them. And my father had uh, took holiday and preparations are made and then they come a telegram, no, it's forbidden, with no reason, nothing. And this was, and then when it's possible, then we drove to the border. We are all, all every time we are very excited because at the border it take one hour, two hour, uh, they, they put the whole car, uh, everything from the car they put out. And if you, if you have a, a map uh, from, from Berlin, for example, and there's a street of the 17th of June, they, they say, what's that? It's a, it's a, a West propaganda. Mm -hmm. And then you, it took one, one hour more at the border. It's a very small housing stage, only 250 houses, only three blocks of flat. There's a tall for block of flat and the two lower ground. And I wanted to make sure that my children mix with everybody, so I went and joined the committee of the Tenants and Rest Association and I worked with them quite a long time. That way my children could join with everybody and go and play football went swimming and went to school and met few friends but he was still segregating with the grown-ups the grown-ups didn't meet or talk to anybody if he went to the christmas party it was all a group of clicky people standing around talking to each other it has changed a little bit now but then again in the last 15 or 20 years he's gone the other way around completely it's changed uh, not many people mixing with each other I think it was one of the first, uh, as people ex exchanges with, with uh, English uh, a school, I was invited 1952 to take uh, a part of this, and I was very homesick in England, but I had a very very kind family and uh, this 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 mother she wanted to give me the egg the only egg we were astonished mm -hmm. that we we didn't have this cards to buy meat and uh, sugar when i came back to germany working I decided that I didn't want to l really lose my own culture, which was at that time American, Polish-American. And so I had to decide and come to terms, how American am I going to be and how European am I going to be, or German? And it was a lot of exclusion uh, in the fact that um, when I left American, uh, let me put it this way, 
when I left a strictly American company and went to work for an international company that had German managers, I had to be better uh, uh, than who they could hire locally because I had a lot of um, disadvantages, okay? A uh, woman, American, and maybe they didn't like Americans or had a grudge against Americans, and my German was as good as the local hires. So I was excluded from a lot of opportunities. And, but you work your way through this, and people have these problems all over the world, and I wasn't going to give up. The one time I have felt actively um, unwelcome due to being an, uh, well, immigrant in general, it was actually being an American in particular, was about the first year I moved over to the UK. Um, one of my then partner's friends, we were having a discussion and we were, we'd both been drinking and he was a bit drunk and I can't even remember why he came out with the comment, but he came out with the comment, well, at least I come from a civilized country, which was a little bit below the belt, but he almost immediately recognized that what he'd said had crossed a line and apologized. Um, what I find completely heartwarming is after the election in 2016, when I would have expected there to be a f an uptick in commentary about you're an American, how can you idiots be such idiots? Um, instead, um, there's just been this enormous outpouring of support for yes, we understand that like this is an aberration and we will help you protect your democracy. Um, Bernie and I went on the march after, uh, the day after the inauguration, and I think there were about 150,000 people on that march, Not, nowhere near all of whom could possibly be American. When I was 18 years old, I, I started with my work um, and it was always the people were very friendly and um, and tried to put to put some things together. But when they meet at uh, uh, for each other, the the Bavarians, they only do it with with the people they know very well, and and they don't open the the doors at the beginning. Before I come here, I, I, I have really thought and thought, I'm an Austrian, I'm also a Bavarian, a German one, a little bit. Uh, I like I like Vienna, I like, this is my home, but I like also Bavarian, because it's the home from home. And I feel, I feel a part of Bavaria and I feel a, a, a small part of Austria. And then I thought, I think I'm really uh, an European. Uh, I'm. I think it's. I can't. I can't say. Uh, I'm only yeah, an Austrian or I only a German one. <laughs> in Munich, I know several people. When I, in, in, when I come to Würzburg, I know nobody there. So. But in Munich, I have a very close friend, Christoph. I know him from Braunschweig, yeah? from the uh, childhood. He, he moved uh, to Munich and I moved to Munich. Yeah, it was a kind of a little small, smaller version of Vienna. The certain changes are coming up. Me, personally, I'm not happy. Gentri gentrifying the, the word they kept using because if you gentrify everything where would the local people go who can't afford it so you, st you should still have it certain things as it is 
uh, East Street Market. It's got a history over 125 years old. You got Peckham Market. We should never lose those things because if we lose that, then you will lose the ethic of the people. My community is in SE5, where I live in SE5, and the Peckham got their own SE15. But if we start introducing to say that it's a community because you belong to certain religion or certain sect of a religion, then you're breaking up the community. Community should be everybody together. All the houses are going quite up market and middle class. People that can afford to buy them, because otherwise it, the price of property in London is so high. But really, if you're not in social housing, you haven't got any chance, if you're poor, to rent or buy. So the richer people are buying the properties. There's a lot of new builds. Some of them are for social housing, some for private rent. But then a lot of those social housing ones, unless you're on benefits, the rents are still quite high. If you're just in an average working job. There's about, what, 100 flats in, in our building. And we know the names of exactly three people because those are the people who've knocked on our door for some specific reason. Everybody else is just a mystery. It's, it's a little bit isolating and it's a little bit soulless. I mean, the, the vibe that you get walking down one of the corridors in our block of flats is a hotel. A lot of the businesses are failing. Um, which is sad to see, you know, if you was to walk through Green Lane Shopping Centre, you would see a lot of empty shops. We used to have loads of pubs, um, there's a lot of pubs closing down. There seems to be a lot of coffee shops opening, which, you know, you, you only need a certain amount of coffee shops. I just feel that it, something has to give in the town, something has to um, happen for it to get back to where it used to be. Biddeford is just growing and growing and growing and Biddeford and Barnstable will eventually meet. They're just gradually getting closer to clo closer and closer. It's going to be one big estate. I'm not, I'm not happy with the way things are developed. I appreciate a development has to happen, but I don't like the fact that they will chop down woodland to develop when there's still brownfield sites clearly available to use. And I know it's all down to cost. But I just think we've really got to be um, looking after the nature that, you know, that we all love and enjoy. In Locksaw, where we are now, there's the, the, the people who've been there for generations, three, perhaps three generations of being true Devonians, but now there are people like myself, like coming from Essex. Um, so there's quite a, now quite a lot of movement of people coming in from, from outside of, 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 of Devon, you know. So it's, it's, but I think if we have found that the, the people have, have always been very welcoming. I think now they're, they're like on the committee and they've got now, so there's a welcoming pack. So you feel your neighbours, even if they're half a mile or a mile or two ways, two miles away, they're still your neighbours. And of course now you've got contact by phone and by email. So if somebody isn't well, or somebody can't drive into town and you can contact them and say, are you okay for shopping or um, any problem, you know, can I help you? Uh, this happens in our village at Loxo. One of them, uh, they are usually um, farmers. And his wife died a couple of years ago and we said we wanted to uh, see you and he said wait a minute I have to ask my daughter and we thought oh he has to ask his daughter and he called back and he said yes please come on Sunday afternoon at two o'clock and we came and he had asked his daughter to make a pie for us to make coffee for us you know he really wanted to um, yeah to invite us we have to, to recognize that uh, Dachau is a learn art. It's a place for learning. To, to make something good uh, um, of the evil of the past. And so in, in this respect, I can say the, my environment, my surrounding, our surrounding here has changed, deeply changed, and, and in a very positive way. 
uh, but an, another um, development that is a very sad thing when you visit the, the most difficult part of the concentration camp that was uh, the, uh, the arrest block where, where uh, prisoners got punished under horrible conditions and from that block when you when you approach to it you can uh, all over the, the the wall you can see these uh, innocent houses of the day and this is a horrible contrast and it should not not have been allowed ever in the military base there is now a refugee place the bavarian government doesn't want to have these refugees here in our place here there are 1000 refugees mostly young men from north north africa and they have not very good chances to stay here and that there are difficult situations if you bring them together and if they stay there for months or for years um, that causes problems and you don't have to be surprised if there's some aggression there if they need the police and uh, um, and if some people talk about these Africans in a negative way, that makes me angry. But I think they could do more for integration. There's a lot more people that are um, holiday makers and from other races, different languages, different people from back, different backgrounds. I, I quite like the um, mixture of the community. You can't be successful coming from Peckham. Look at one, look at one of my mates on Tarford Road. He did a book out. The Range Face went to Peckham. You know, he landed, topped the road from East Enders. But I think the generation needs to know that. I got from my white friends, call them middle class, call them whatever you want to call them. They're great people. But you also got the other ones that they come in and I don't even talk to you. But the feeling is, you know what? We'll always get changed whilst we're living. But it's for us, whether we accept it or not. And I always say change, yeah? If you can't do nothing about it, you've got to accept it, you've got to work with it. But it's for us, 